<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to try and make you laugh and enjoy this as much as possible. I haven't prepared anything, so it should be quite funny. I'm also slightly distracted by this woman who I keep thinking is going to take her clothes off in front of me. This is like a sort of Vegas uh, convention. But I'm going to watch... Oh, you've changed it. That's typical. Just as I was getting going. Um, uh, lighting the fire. I'm not an arsonist. I, um, I'm quite keen on uh, working on really exciting people in the retail sphere. So at Mission, we work for Amazon on their fashion accounts. And obviously, that includes Kindle. And uh, we work for Barclay Card, and you might have seen some uh, ads on the buses with the tap technology, which I'll talk about in a bit in a second. And we also work on some fashion brands. There's a big fashion brand called J. Crew, which we're launching in the UK, which will take a site uh, on Regent Street in November. So it's a very exciting moment for us in this sphere and how we can really get people excited about it and move it forward. Um, again, if I go back to lighting the fire, it... It means, for me, that you're exciting. And exciting can often mean educating or informing. But often it's just seeing really, really good stuff. And it's presented in the right way to the right person. And I think we should think of digital in that sense. That putting a large screen in a store can be incredibly exciting, particularly for the marketing department and the people who've installed the screen. But is it relevant to the people coming in? And I think you need to ask yourself your question before you try and do that. So that's why my first one is a little bit controversial, which is I think there was an element of shoehorning digital and exciting things into store. Now, don't get me wrong, this is amazing. And all the things that are around you are amazing, because I don't want to offend anyone from a TV manufacturers. But it's the content that really matters, and that's what's important to the consumer. They don't know it yet, but they're starting to work out that all this stuff can be a bit of bells and whistles unless the content it's delivering is good. So I think just doing it for the sake of it, I remember two or three years ago, you, everyone would get excited about the latest um, Facebook app that was enacted in a school where people could share information globally with other consumers about what genes they were buying. Now, that all was, that's really brilliant, and it works really well on a PowerPoint presentation. But in reality, when I used to look at the data, it was very few people that actually did it because they're walking into a shop to buy stuff, and they're, they're looking, walking into a shop to be enthused by what's there. So we've got to sort of stick step backwards slightly, rather like old-fashioned retailers. And I know there's a TV show on, that has been on recently about Mr. Selfridge and the way he looked at it, that it was a sort of theatre, a bit of a circus, a bit of fun, and there was amazing choice. So there would always be something for the right consumer there. And I think if we step back a bit and then look at how we can use technology to engage that consumer, then we can really move the whole process forward. People have sort of 89-inch flat screens in their houses now, and they have computers in their loos, which is terrifying. And they have, a, most amazingly, a very a computer equivalent to five years ago desktop sitting in their pocket. We also do the PR for Nokia, which means when I pulled out my iPhone, I'm probably going to get fired. <laughs> but um, I think there's a fascinating point there, that they already have that technology. And we can get all excited about millennials and about first adopters of the internet, who are now probably sort of 40 or 50, and all these different segments of the market. But if they're not seeing good products presented in the right way, then there's really no point spending all this money on all this exciting stuff. So a step back is kind of my first rule. And um, I'll get to actually a, a kind of controversial point later, because I'll just be rude to everyone. But that segues nicely onto... I've only got 15 minutes, so I'll be really quick. And I'll try and keep it clean. But, I mean, the point... There's a fantastic Nokia on the right there, just so you know. <laughs> Available now. New one coming out. Oh, no, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, so the Nokia there is fantastic, and that's okay as well. But um, there's a kind of interesting point there that I was thinking about um, a few days ago, that I kind of saw some QR codes in a, in a store, which is great, and they thought, oh, what an amazing idea. People can pull out their phone, and they can interact with the product even more and experience what it was about and all this. In fact, obviously, when you hit the QR code, you just had a model twirling around on your phone with the product on, which is kind of pointless because the product's actually there and you could be the person trying it on. And then I thought, how useful are these in a retail experience? And then I, th I thought, if, if you needed to ring your mum in a shop, they'd be really useful. Or if you needed to check the sports scores, or if you needed to text a friend, they'd be incredibly useful. As a retailer, wouldn't it be exciting to actually make people leave them in their pocket? And... 
produce an experience so enthralling and exciting and educating and ultimately lead them on a really good journey to buying a product, whether it's using digital media or whatever, rather than use, getting people pulling these out and checking prices and doing boring stuff and being uh, not concentrating on the store experience. It's a great benefit at Harrods is that it's got very bad reception for phones inside. So <laughs> a lot of people in the store, they don't have anything they can do except shop. It's fine. When you're paying, I know there's someone from Harrods here today, but when you're paying ten pounds for a milkshake, it's quite painful. But um, but you're there and you can't do anything else because you have to be fully immersed in the Harrods experience, and it's unintentional. But there's something there that, as as retailers, the first thing you think is how can I how can I enact someone to use that amazing mobile technology? How can they share this item with their friends um, in store? And perhaps it's a good idea to keep it in their pocket. That says. If you want to run a live elephant through your store, you'll probably get quite a few Instagram followers. So there are interesting ideas you can do that. And there's something interesting about Instagram per se in that the type of consumer that is using that now is really, interesting in really interested in educating their friends. There's kind of different mediums or channels for the way you communicate with your friend. And yes, Instagram is a lot about experiences and views and what I had for breakfast. But also Instagram is about sharing really interesting um, products in a sense that when you buy a car or something like that or you've just bought an incredibly expensive meal, people at Heston Blumenthal are constantly Instagramming their food to their friends. It is a way of showing off, but also it's something spectacular and beautiful. So I suppose my second lesson would be they've got all the computer technology in their pocket already, so you don't need to bamboozle them and get them to use it again. But if there's something really magical in your store or an amazing product... You know, why not? Uh, and you don't need to enact them to do that. They should be doing that naturally. Imagine putting signs up saying, why didn't you Instagram this cake to your friends? You're going to look terrible. So I think there's a good lesson there that we shouldn't try and shoehorn in the technology in their pocket into the retail experience and perhaps let them do it themselves. Um, I did a project a few years ago which I called, well, I mean, the agency I spent a fortune on, called uh, Always On. And the idea was to have an entirely digital window of a... Um, a retail store, it was a fashion retailer. So at night, people could shop online in your window. So they'd walk up to this amazing screen, and all the manufacturers here are thinking, this is marvellous. Um, but they could walk up to the screen and start purchasing off your website. And, and at the time, we thought this was the most seamless way of getting a connection between your um, online business and your bricks and mortar retail. Now, uh, and for years, I, there was a different head of department for our, when I was working at a fashion brand, r running the digital, and I was running the, the marketing for the stores, and it was like pitch warfare, because often they're different sort of cost centres, and they have, you're both reporting to the same person, you want to beat their figures. And so I'd be very resistant to putting a, a website on the window. I said, everyone knows a website, there's no point putting it in the window, until I thought of this brilliant idea of actually putting their website in my window. And I actually thought... Uh, and I thought about it a lot, and obviously we didn't do it because it was too expensive, but there was a nice piece there that actually your consumers could be at home with their family shopping online when they're sitting in front of the fire, and that they don't need to be vomited on on Oxford Street whilst they're trying to buy a T-shirt in your window, <laughs> and that you should actually be a little bit more sympathetic to their needs, and that the whole point of having fantastic uh, online platforms to buy stuff... Um, there's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing wrong with them. And do the two need to seamlessly fit together? Which brings us on to the next point, which is this, that, in fact, your retail might not really be as good as your digital, because often your um, discounted items on your digital platform, i.e. your website um, or app, will be presented exactly the same way as your full-price items. Uh, whereas in the store environment, one's jumper on the floor and the other one's in the window. So there's a kind of nice, there's a nice message there that... You've always thought of your um, retail as being better, in a sense, that that's the experiential, that's where you're touching product and getting a feel for it. But does it, does it feel that well to consumers? It, is it that good to consumers? And I do look at um, some big retailers who are falling behind in their retail experience, and they're not utilising digital in their retail, and the clothes look rubbish. I'm talking about clothes specifically here. The clothes look rubbish in the store, and then you go on their website, and actually everything looks relatively clean and, and well-delivered and slick. And you've start, you need to start thinking about how you can actually bring your retail up to scratch with your digital platforms, not the other way around. And how you can add value to that retail experience. You're thinking, I don't want to add value. I'm really paying 
bloody huge rents. Um, but there's something... Into, oh, HMV, they're, they're doing well. But the... Um, the um, uh, I didn't do all the pictures on these slides. You, you might notice that as we move forward. Um, so I think there's an interesting question there. And having a huge digital platform in your window uh, wasn't a good idea, and I still don't think it is really, unless you're selling um, these for a living. Okay, um, I didn't realise Mary Porters was in this until about five minutes ago, so I apologise because her she's not here. Good, because she's terrifying. Uh, but there, there she is. And Mary Porters is a good example of what we call creating the queuing moment. So being popular is... Um, it's like the Oscars. I've got an elapsed time clock here, so I know how long I've been on for, and the whole thing will explode in about four minutes. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, but Mary Porter is very good at creating what, what we like to call a queuing moment, which you all know is that kind of Apple Store opening or the first morning of whatever I turd they produced this year. <laughs> and and the, that buzz and that excitement. So it's a kind of way... We kind of remember that we need to add value and we need to make the shopping experience really exciting for them, but we also need everyone to feel that other people are doing it. It's an app core tenant of what you're doing uh, in retail is to create that excitement and that buzz. And I think uh, a step forward would be to, um, to kind of manage people's expectations, but also how you can cross-reference your digital with that uh, queuing moment and how you can make it exciting. And obviously the obvious thing is to have sort of countdown clocks. But I think as we move forward and we start tracking our consumers better, um, we'll be able to start utilising digital platforms to have that kind of buzz and excitement and that there's only five products left. And I think there's, um, there's no reason why we can't have retail to be exciting. And, um, well, I'll move on on the next point. I think this one we kind of skipped on a little bit. Sorry, we mentioned earlier already, which is the shop window. And I think the balance is right. Uh, the balance needs, sorry, the balance needs to be found in this area. And I don't think we're getting it right in the UK at the moment. I think some retail, retailers do a really good job and some do a disastrous job in the messages they send out in their windows. Um, I had an interesting... Is anyone here from Ferragamo? Good, I can talk. So I, had, um, I chatted someone from Italy uh, last week, which was really interesting. And this is for people who are kind of in the luxury sector. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, in a kind of VM versus sales versus what you want to sell tomorrow kind of uh, mashup, which is the kind of Ferragamo Hermes comparison. Now, Hermes make their money, and there's, don't, there's no bones about it, they make their money in fragrances and ties and silk and in really expensive bags, and that's how they make their money. And they make millions and millions and millions, sorry, billions and billions. They do a fantastic job. Ferragamo, which is a classic Italian shoe brand, make their money the same way. The difference is the sales and the well, kind of the, the teams that run the stores of Ferragamo, they put all their cash cow products in the window. So you go past a Ferragamo window and there's a tie and there's a glove and there's an accessory or a tie pin or a wallet. Go past an Hermes window, there's fashion, there's style, there's glamour, there's innovation. There's something really interesting. And then occasionally there are ties and scarves. But they, they have the confidence as a business to put their landmark, their halo, their fabulous products in the window and make noise. Now, of course, they're a very successful business, so they have that luxury. But when you start putting boring things in window, windows, you're going to start having boring customers. And I really think, I really think uh, windows should be product-driven principally, and that product should be really exciting and good. And I think if you stick to that rule, um, you'll do well as a business moving forward, if you start breaking those rules and start putting, oh, we do sell a lot of beige trousers, better put them in the window, then you're starting to move backwards. And I think consumers over time pick up on that. And if it's a dull item, they won't walk past the window and go, oh, I must get a pair of those. They'll eventually come in to explore what's exciting about your store. And utilising digital, like these retailers have, whilst utilising products in the right way, can be really fun and engaging. And we just, with um, J. Crew have made six videos about how the cloth is made in a factory for a suit. But we talked to all the people who cut it, who've been there for 50 years. And then we spoke to the uh, vice president of Creativity, Jen Lyon, about, president, sorry, about her favourite shoes. And then we cut to the Etta factory in Italy where they were making the shoes. Now, these are those sort of 90-second, two-minute videos that really don't get many hits on YouTube. But when we start, if we start to play with those on a Kindle Fire or an iPad or whatever, in stores next to the product 
then you're making a little movie, a little hero movie about that product. And that doesn't sound particularly exciting or um, earth-shattering as a, as a creative digital idea, but you're, um, you're bringing a backbone of story to each product that you sell. And if the product holds up to it and is good enough, then you've got a really interesting idea there about educating at point of sale in a really engaging way. So this Gap video clearly is of a really good-looking guy walking around a bit in jeans. Um, and I'm sure a video about making those jeans wouldn't be that exciting because it'd probably be in Manila at four in the morning with some three-year-olds. But the... No, not, not saying that about Gap because they're a fantastic company that ethically sources everything. Um, but getting that, getting that balance right, I think, is really important. And I think often we get all of those, the, the, the presentation right, but then we completely deliver the wrong content. Which moves me on to something seamlessly, which is a completely different subject. Um, I think the, um, there was a story today about some really annoying little kid who sold his app for £30 million. Did anyone see that? What a shit. Um, and if I told someone today, and he goes, I pulled that shit bag out of a party, and he groped my girlfriend. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's your dot-com millionaire written all over. But I, um, what, um, what interested me about that is that he's an aggregator. He's an editor of news. So his, his app, or whatever it is, is on a phone, and it gives you all the news headlines in bite-sized chunks. Genius. Um, it's called Teletext, you idiot. Um, but uh, he's done that, and he's been really successful doing that. And I think um, an edit is more important than we think. We've been obsessing about giving as much product and access to as much product to consumers for a very long time. And it's that kind of House of Fraser moment where you go into whatever store has a concession, House of Fraser, and it has an edit, and you go, oh, I wish there was more. But I think as you start taking consumers through a journey, both digitally and in retail and in both at the same time, you can start editing if you can explain why you're doing it. So this is a website called Nuji, which is like an aggregator. You basically tag when you're on other people's websites. I'm over my time, so I'll be one minute. Um, you can tag products that you've seen online, and it will put it on a page for you, like Pinterest. But obviously, each of these products you can hit and go straight through to that website and buy. And obviously, they're going to make an affiliate amount of money. But I love this idea of editing in retail. And I think if you can put a, if you say the edits by an individual. So you have a smaller store and you say, but this store is entirely edited by our head of menswear design, Steve. Or this is entirely edited by our head of design or whoever, whatever type of business you're in, or our owner. Then there's something really interesting and really engaging to consumers about that, that someone has gone out and made a thought about what the products are. And I think there's an interesting thing there. I'll be very quick here. Know your customer. I think everyone says that a million times. I did some work with a company called Footfall123, and it was about um, speaking to customers in retail uh, in the same way you would talk to them online, in the, in the sense that you know what their buying habits were. So every time someone was going in, rather like a Tesco's club card, you were analysing that. I think we need to look at this um, big information in a more interesting way. And I think not just necessarily knowing that person's size or sex is good enough anymore. And I think using digital in-stores to engage what they really want to get back from you is really special. Um, and that's something we've done with J. Crew, where we actually say to people, don't go to this store, go to another store, because they have a better selection of clothes for your type of shopping. That's not like one store for fat people, one store for thin people, just so you know. It's like an edit thing. Um, I think, as I've gone on about this, and I'm really running out of time, but product focus throughout. If you've got a good product, then you can, it can go anywhere and be seen by anyone, and it can work for you. And I think sometimes we're a bit nervous about putting our best products out in front of people and, and utilising digital in retail is a great way of telling that product story and how amazing it is. Um, and finally, from the PR man, I'm really moving forward. We're having a big think about um, public relations in general. And we're starting to feel that conventional PR isn't really working the same way it used to. And that you need to light that fire under consumers, not like sort of Guy Fawkes, but light the fire under consumers and make, it, make them excited by what they're seeing and what they're doing. And, and using elements of modern technology, really good customer service, really product focus, really well-trained um, store staff through to the people that are answering the calls or answering emails. If all those magic moments happen, you don't need to pay a lot for above-the-line marketing. You don't need affiliate programs or big PR companies to help you. The people will do it for you. They will talk about you. Whichever social media outlet they use or utilise, or wherever they talk to their friends, maybe even in a pub. I mean, that does actually happen, apparently. People talk in pubs. Um, and, and then you, you just need PR to little, little moments to increase that awareness. 
and it means you spend a lot less money and time marketing yourself and a lot more time focusing on your product. So that's me being a PR man that puts you out of business. Um, quick thing, very quick, that I'm obsessed about at the moment, that website, Nuji, this is what J. Crew use in the States, very personal stylists. These dudes will actually take your bags to a hotel for you from the shop. They will tell you that even you try on the most expensive dress, they'll say, it's not quite right for you. And I mean that in a really nice way. That, that voice made it sound quite annoying. But they're actually really good at what they do. And this I love, which is um, an Instagram Polaroid camera. So these dudes in, uh, sorry, I'm saying that. These Italian guys have persuaded Polaroid to uh, give them the license, and they've made an Instagram camera. So this is a classic example of sharing data digitally, and someone has a walk away with a photo of them in a kind of retro style, wearing fantastic product. Final one. I saw this yesterday, so I, I saw this last week and I thought I'd just put it on. What happens in an internet minute? And this is how fast we need to start thinking, which is really freaking me out. Um, so 20 people in one minute have their identity stolen. That's cool, isn't it? Um, 204 million emails are sent. 47,000 apps are downloaded. I thought apps were old hat last year. I'm having a rethink on that. I think apps are quite cool. Um, so that's 80, Amazon's great client. 83,000 in sales in one minute. Uh, 61 hours of music come off. LinkedIn has 100 plus new LinkedIn accounts. And just these monstrous figures. So, but this is the key takeaway, is the further growth is staggering. Um, so total number of network devices in 2015, the number will double. So that's, let me do the maths, two years. Uh, that number will double. So it's freaky, guys. And so it's all moving very quickly. Even the coolest mobile handsets are after six months getting a lag and looking outdated. I now run five minutes over my time, so I'm about to get electrocuted. But thank you very much. I've gone over way too much stuff, but um, I hope some of the things resonated, probably how annoying I am. But um, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Cheers.